Welcome to chapter 12 of our trek through the solar system. We're going to look at some of the smaller things today, but of course, if you are taking this class in the summer of 2020, uh, as I'm speaking, the comet that I'm showing you behind me right now, uh, which is Comet Neowise, is actually in the sky. And if it stops clouding up every night, you might be able to see it uh, up towards the northwest. This is not the first comet that we've had that is visible to the naked eye. It won't be the last one either. But comets are typically unpredictable in terms of how and when we discover them. We'll talk a little bit about that here as we're going through our uh, PowerPoint. And we're going to talk about asteroids and we'll talk about Pluto and how Pluto is perhaps more like a comet than a planet. Uh, but but uh, without any further ado, uh, let's get started on the chapter. Let me share my screen here uh, so that we can see what's going on. And of course, we start out with, in a picture form, uh, pictures of Pluto. So let's start the slideshow and let's get the show on the road. When Pluto was first discovered way back in 1930, there are people still alive actually who were even adults. I know one person who is edging near 110 years old. Uh, so she would have been a teenager when Pluto was discovered. In 1930, this picture on the left is what it looked like. It was discovered in the Lowell Observatory, Percival Lowell, who I think we talked about a little bit earlier with the canals on Mars, if you remember that discussion. Uh, he set up this observatory. He had passed away by 1930, but the Lowell Observatory is still a thing. It's still out there and you can visit it today. Uh, but Clyde Tombaugh discovered this using a telescope not too different from ones that I have in, in my uh, back office. So, so it wasn't even a major, major telescope. But he was a very good observationist to find that little thing there, that little dot, moved a little bit through the sky from night to night. Now, as we got better and better with telescopes, even the great Hubble only gave us this kind of view. We had to get up close and personal with New Horizons, a probe that reached it in 2015, to get any kind of detail at all. And this little heart-shaped thing on the side uh, is now called the Tombaugh Plane, uh, which is named after Clyde Tombaugh, who was the one who discovered it back in 1930. Uh, but we're going to talk about comets and asteroids, and we'll throw in some dwarf planets in for good measure, uh, because Pluto may have more in common with a comet than a planet, and there's at least one asteroid, perhaps two, that qualify also as dwarf planets along the way. Uh, we can see them quite distinctly different comets from asteroids if they're near the sun, because comets begin to melt and grow a tail, and asteroids do not. But in terms of asteroids, we have more than 150,000 in catalogs that we have found. Uh, Ceres is the largest one. And of course, if, if uh, we think about lar things being large, uh, let me see if I can get my little annotation thing here and you'll see how well I can draw. Uh, let's see, can, will it let me draw? Yes. If we had something, say, about the size of Texas here. This is a very poor drawing of Texas. I apologize to Texas. Uh, if we were to take the asteroid series, it would just fit inside of Texas like that. Uh, it would not stretch the entire distance across on, in either direction. So compared to the Earth, Ceres is really small, but it's large enough to be spherical. Forgive my drawing there, my drawing is not spherical. But, but Ceres in it itself is uh, 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 spherical. Uh, it's the only one of the asteroids that's truly spherical. There's a second one called Vesta that is almost spherical. In fact, it's spherical if you look at one side and egg-shaped if you look at it from the other side. Uh, both of these were discovered a little over 200 years ago in the early 1800s. But we keep finding more and more. There are probably more than a million asteroids out there that are about half a mile across or larger. But the really big ones like Ceres and Vesta and, and uh, Pallas and others have been discovered quite a long time ago. Uh, that's actually one of the mistakes in the movie Armageddon. If you've ever seen the movie Armageddon, when they have this asteroid heading towards the, the Earth and the president on the line talking to NASA says, how big is it? 
And Billy Bob Thornton, who's playing the head of NASA at that time, says, well, it's as big as Texas. Er, wrong, nope, nope, nope. There's only one series that's the size of Texas, and we've known about it for over 200 years. They don't just pop up out of nowhere. That's one of the differences between asteroids and comets, is comets can come from very far away and surprise us. The asteroids were not going to be surprised by finding an asteroid suddenly the size of Texas that we'd never seen before. Now, if we put all of the asteroids together, they wouldn't even add up to Mercury. They wouldn't even add up to a small planet. Uh, these are leftovers from when the planets were formed, and we'll talk a little bit about why they're left over here shortly. Let's see, I need to close that there so we can go to the next slide. Comets, on the other hand, are far, far out. Asteroids mostly live in the inner or middle of the solar system around Jupiter and Mars. Comets mostly live out beyond Pluto. They are out beyond where the sun will melt them, so they are outside the frost line. And we often refer to them as dirty snowballs because they're not just H2O. Uh, you've er ever heard the phrase, don't eat the yellow snow? Well, you don't want to eat comets either. In fact, they are, are black as coal dust. If you've ever seen toner from a toner cartridge from a photocopier, that's about how dark they are because they've got all of this carbonate stuff on them along the way. Uh, they only grow tails if they come into the inner solar system and begin to melt. That our comet Neowise, uh, which I have in the picture over here, uh, is growing a tail because it's in closer to the sun. As it gets further and further away from the sun, the tail gets less and less and less until it goes back out beyond the frost line and it's no longer melting. If it comes in close, we call it a sun grazing comet. And of course, sometimes they crash into the sun, so they don't just graze, they actually collide. Dwarf planets, on the other hand, are things that are large enough to be spherical, they have to be large enough to have their gravity pull them into a sphere, so they can't be egg-shaped or potato-shaped or wedge-shaped or anything like that. They could be like asteroids or like comets. They could be big snowballs or big rocky pieces. Most of the ones we found are out beyond Pluto. Uh, they include Eris and Makimaki and Haumea. There are others that are, that are out there called Sedna and, uh, so, uh, and, and a few that don't have names yet. Uh, we have to figure out whether or not they qualify as dwarf planets each time we discover them. And then there's Ceres, remember Ceres? That's one of the asteroids. It is also a dwarf planet. You can be more than one thing in our solar system. Now, dwarf planets can have moons. Guess what? So can asteroids. Asteroids can have moons. Here are some of the ones that I mentioned. Uh, before. These are Eris, Pluto, Makimaki, Haumea. Now look at Haumea. It is a little bit oblong, so there's still some people who debate whether or not it should be a dwarf planet. Then we've got Sedna and Quar Or and Orcus, and Orcus is really, really tiny. It's about as small as you can be along with Ceres and still be a dwarf planet. Any smaller than that and you cease to be spherical. But a lot of them have moons. You notice that Pluto has five or four moons that we know of, or five moons, I'm sorry. Uh, if you include Charon here as a twin to Pluto, we sometimes call this a dwarf planet double system with Pluto and Charon as both dwarf planets with four moons around the two of them. That's why I made that little mistake there a moment ago. Uh, because look at the size of Charon here and look at the size of Ceres. They're about the same size. Now, well, let's go back to asteroids. Asteroids sometimes come close enough to us and comets come close enough to us and leave rocky debris. And those are we call meteors and meteorites. Now, a meteorite is what you can pick up from the ground, that if something has survived the trek through our solar system and through our atmosphere uh, and left a rocky bit, that's a meteorite. A meteor is the streak that you see through the sky. But that is, if, if it doesn't actually survive all the way down to the ground, it won't leave a meteorite. A meteoroid, most people don't use that word very often, but a meteoroid is the rock that's just floating out there before it's caught by our atmosphere. So these are the three things uh, to keep in mind. This meteoroid thing I added, it's not in your, original, uh, in your original PowerPoint here. 
Sometimes meteorites hit things and cause damage. Here's one from about 20 years ago in Chicago, came through a uh, ceiling. We've had things hit cars, we've had things hit trees, uh, we've had things hit a lot of different things. We can have a big, big, big chunk like the one that hit and killed the dinosaurs. We tend to stop calling them meteorites when they're a mile across. Uh, but meteorites have not to date been verified to have ever hit someone and killed them. Uh, so, so, so despite the fact that we have thousands falling every day that people can see and millions more that we don't, and that's not an exaggeration, uh, in fact, they don't tend to survive the atmosphere very much and they don't tend to do lots and lots of damage. Now, most of these things are leftovers from asteroids. Asteroids can be very big. Here's the edge of Ceres. Here's the edge of Vesta. Here are some of the other asteroids. Notice these little pieces that are in parentheses. Those are the space missions that have been to these. Either they've been directly to them or they fly, they've flown by them on their way to something else. The Dawn mission, which went to the two largest ones here, Ceres on the left and Vesta to the right, was the first spacecraft to go to something, go into orbit around it, and then leave and go to another thing, and then go into orbit around that. Usually once you're in orbit of something, you're stuck. You can't actually leave. And a lot of things are flybys, like uh, the Galileo probe went into orbit of Jupiter, but it flew by Ida and Dactyl here. Uh, the, the Rosetta mission was off to a comet, but it flew by Lutetia here. Uh, so there are different, and also Steins over here. So there are different missions. We've been up close and personal with several different asteroids. And there is a mission right now, and in fact, that's reminding me, I will post up something uh, that's a video about that, uh, the, called uh, the OSIRIS-REx mission, and it is going to the asteroid Bennu. And it's in operation right now. So I'm going to post up a video on, on Bennu's uh, 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 mission. And I will also post up something on the Rosetta mission. Uh, the Rosetta mission was actually an ESA, a European Space Agency mission, rather than a NASA mission. So they put together a, a neat little video for you on that. Asteroids are typically not round, not spherical. Uh, Vesta and Ceres are the two main exceptions. They are heavily cratered. They don't have volcanoes. They don't have atmospheres. They don't have other kinds of things to change their, their appearance. So that only happens when they get hit by different things that are out there. Some have moons. There's Ida, which is probably about the size of Monroe County, and Dactyl, which is probably about the size of uh, sort of a super Walmart. It's not very large at all along the way. But as long as nothing else gravitationally is pulling it away, it will stay in orbit of Ida. So remember, everything out there has gravity. It's just whatever is larger has more gravity around it. So when we see this kind of arrangement, there are lots of asteroids that have, have um, moons or satellites, we can use Newton's equations to figure out the density. And we find out that some of them are very solid, sort of chunks of iron. Some of them are more like sandbags. They're not very dense at all uh, along the way. And we can tell that by doing mathematical equations, watching them go around each other. And that applies to Newtonian's equations because we can measure the distance and we know the gravitational constant. And so now all we need to figure out are the two masses. So it becomes a relatively simple uh, calculation to do. Now here's Vesta. Vesta was, as I mentioned, visited by the Dawn spacecraft. Dawn went to Vesta first and went into orbit. As I mentioned before, when we look at it in one direction, it looks almost spherical. But when we look at it in another direction, it's sort of egg-shaped along the way. Uh, so this is why it's sort of on the edge. Do we count it as a dwarf planet also or not? But then Dawn left Vesta and came to Ceres. And you can see Ceres is indeed spherical, just a little bit oblate. Most things are. We have this big bright spot here, which is in the center of an impact crater. So something hit it and blew away the dust and debris from the surface. And we can actually see and a sort of a salty or mineral, uh, reflective mineral, maybe metallic uh, kind of, kind of uh, stuff just underneath the surface here. 
We also have different kinds of mountain ranges and deep uh, pockets where other impacts have happened all along the surface. You can see here near the South Pole area, there's a big depression. There's a, a bit of one here, but the secondary one that goes outside here, that was a major impact at one point in the past. We have gotten very close. Uh, the Japanese Space Agency, JAXA, and Hayabusa up. Actually, Hayabusa 2 is something that's in operation. I think it's still in operation now, or it's just completed it, it, its task. Uh, but it got up close to the asteroid called Itakawa. And if you look at this, it looks like it's uh, really mottled. It's, it, it, it almost looks like it has like smallpox or something like that. Uh, that was my first thought when I saw Itakawa here. Uh, but one of the things that happens with some of these is they're far enough away that they keep frost and snow and ice on the surface. So sometimes they are less pockmarked by impacts from, from other debris, other asteroids, and, and uh, have fewer craters, but have other surface features along the way. If something hits us and it's big, chunky iron, it will sometimes survive the trek through the atmosphere. Here's a big a uh, asteroid chunk, so we would call this a meteorite. And in looking at those, we see that there are two main types. Uh, there are some that have been floating around since the solar system started and have never really had anything happen to them. Those are about 4.6 billion years old. We call those primitive. Then there are others that seem to have had something happen to them along the way. They've been shot out of a volcano. They've had a major impact that's sort of melted them and they've reformed. Uh, so, so those we call processed and those can be any age. Those can be a few thousand years old, a few million years old, a few billion, but not 4.6 billion years old. When we look at the primitive ones, again, we can break them into two. There are stony bits and there are carbon rich bits. This is always fascinating to scientists because carbon is one of the elements of life. Then we have processed ones and we have metal rich and processed ones. Now, if you look at this, it looks like there's some cross hatching going on here. Something has happened to this. Then when we look at this one, if you've ever worked with pottery and fired something in a kiln, this looks like it's been fired inside with a smooth surface there. So, so this one, as we look at it and we look at Vesta, we think that something that may have hit Vesta and thrown up debris, some of the particles floated along until they hit the Earth, and this might be a piece of that second largest asteroid, Vesta. So we have a few meteorites from the Moon and Mars. The Moon, obviously, when you look at it, it has lots of pockmarks, lots of craters, something that hits it, can kick debris up, it might actually float away from the moon's primary gravity and get caught by the Earth's gravity and land on the Earth. That may have happened on Mars as well. We've got perhaps half a dozen Mars rocks that have landed on Earth from either an impact hitting Mars and throwing up debris, or maybe one of those major volcanoes that we talked about before, throwing stuff up and floating through the atmosphere, or floating through space to reach our atmosphere, then getting caught here and landing on the surface. Now, the asteroid belt, as I mentioned before, mostly lives between Jupiter and Mars. Uh, we have some that are called Trojan asteroids that sort of trail and lead Jupiter. Uh, there is a thing called Lagrange points. When we're looking at a body like Jupiter, even the Sun, every planet has them. There are different points around the planet or the Moon or whatever we're looking at that have some gravitational equilibriums to them, where if you're over here, the gravity is pulling on you, but at certain points, we would, we, would, we would say things are neutralized. Those are called Lagrange points. Well, there's, they, they tend to be sort of triangulated out from things. So there's going to be one on this side of Jupiter, one on this side of Jupiter, but one on either side. These have collected over time as Jupiter has gone around. And so it's sort of pulling on them. Now notice most of them are closer to Mars than Jupiter. That's not because Mars has more gravity. In fact, Mars has probably only one one thousandth of the gravity of Jupiter. It's actually the opposite. Jupiter has so much gravity, it has scooped up most of the asteroids here and either turned them into moons, to Trojans, or to lunch. Lots of asteroids end up as lunch. 
So what we have going on with the rest of these, the main asteroid belt, most of them live between Jupiter and Mars, are clumpings and groupings. Uh, they didn't get together as a planet. That was one of our questions earlier, largely because Jupiter's gravity over here kept pulling and tugging them away, and the sun's gravity on the other side with the inner planets was pulling and tugging on the other way. So they were acting like chaperones at a dance and keeping them apart. So they now live in clusters or groups that are resonating. We call them orbital resonances. You might remember that when we looked at Saturn's rings, where a moon is pulling in this direction and uh, the, the, Saturn, the, the main gravity of Saturn is pulling in another direction. Uh, we have that between Jupiter and the other planets inside as well as the Sun. Uh, so we have a cluster, a clump around Jupiter. We have those in its uh, sort of Lagrange points. Then we have a couple of other groupings, the main groupings, a little bit closer to Mars than to Jupiter. But the whole process here was figured out by a guy named Kirkwood. And Kirkwood Observatory in Bloomington, if you ever make it down to IU in Bloomington, is named for the guy who figured out the math of all of these gaps. We call these Kirkwood gaps in his honor. And so as you're going down Kirkwood Avenue to find Kirkwood Hall and go over to Kirkwood Observatory at IU, uh, you can say, hey, I know there's stuff out in the solar system named for that guy too. Uh, and, and he was uh, one time called the American Kepler, because remember Kepler figured out where all the planets are and all the different kinds of mathematical arrangements of those as well. Uh, that was a little more significant of, an, uh, of a discovery than, than Kirkwood's, but Kirkwood's is pretty good here and we still live by this process. We still call these Kirkwood gaps in his honor. Now comets don't live in clusters like this. Most, com most comets live quite a bit further out in the solar system. They are usually much smaller. Remember, our biggest asteroid is the size of Texas. The biggest comets tend to be maybe about the size of a city at best. But when they begin to glow, that area around the glow can be, in fact, larger than the Earth. And the tail can be tens of millions of miles long along the way. We have been close to several comets. This one was a mission to Comet Temple 1. We actually launched something into it so that we could watch the fragmentation and figure out what's below the surface. But notice how dark this is. As I, I told you before, it's a dirty snowball. This is about the color of toner cartridge. This is carbon stuff on the, on the surface here. Carbon tends to be dark in color. Think about coal, think about lead in your pencil, think about things like that. Uh, that's what's happening here. Uh, so, so we've been actually up and close to several different comets. Uh, one of the interesting things here is uh, that we, we had several different probes go out to the Halley's Comet uh, 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 appearance in the 1980s, and this one from Giotto, uh, which was the European Space Agency's spacecraft, it got closer than any of the others, shows that it doesn't just glow like a light bulb. It begins to sort of melt and fissure and fracture and has geysers and other kinds of things as it gets closer to the sun. And this generates a tail. And we have two different tails, one that's directly opposite the sun, and that's a sort of energy plasma tail. And then others that are being blown off from that that are particles that are coming off of the comet. And we call that the dust tail. And some of our meteorites that hit the Earth are actually fragments from comets from the dust tails that are out there. So comets have two tails. And if you get a really good look at, new, uh, at Neowise here, you might actually see two tails. When it's living out beyond the frost line, out in the far reaches of the solar system, it's just a snowball. But as it comes in towards the sun, when it hits around the area of the asteroid belt, it will begin to melt because that's where the frost line is. As it gets closer and closer and closer to the sun, the tail grows longer and longer and longer. Notice it begins to split into two tails as it gets close enough to the sun to be about where the Earth is. Notice the tail is also, as the comet goes around the sun, is always pointing away. So it's not like a smokestack from a train where if the train is going like this, 
the smoke is always going in the opposite direction. So the train's going here, but the smoke is always going in the opposite direction. That's not what's happening here because there's not an atmosphere to blow it away. What's happening here is the sun's energy is pushing it and it's always pushing it away from the sun. Uh, so when it's leaving right now, comet Neowise that you're seeing here, it's actually flying in the direction of its tail. So it is flying back into its tail. We sent a mission, again, we colloqu uh, at, at, uh, colloquially as the entire planet, uh, the European Space Agency sent a mission called the Rosetta mission to this comet here, 67P. Now 67P is what we call it because hardly anyone can pronounce cheryumov Uh Comets are often named for the people or the institution that discovered it. Neowise was discovered by a Neowise space uh, platform, and therefore it's called that. Uh, if you see comets Shoemaker-Levy, they were discovered by a trio, three people, uh, the Shoemakers and David Levy. And then we have this one here that was discovered by Cheryumov and Garamasinko. So we call it 67P because that is a mouthful. But we sent a mission to this that actually went into orbit around it. So the Rosetta uh, probe was in a, a, and around it. It also had a backpack uh, that, that uh, landed on the comet, and that was called the Philae lander. And it landed and took a lot of interesting photographs, but it also didn't realize there's no gravity on this. There's almost no gravity because it's not big. So instead of landing, it sort of bounced and it bounced into a shady area and couldn't get solar energy, solar panels charged up. So it didn't last very long. But what we got while we were watching it was fantastic. Notice that, that here's, here's one of the jets of sort of geyser material shooting out as it begins to melt. Here we have several of those coming off and a glow, and it's, it's sort of melting in the direction of the sun at, at the moment here. But as the, the comet itself moves, it will leave that stuff behind and it will begin to grow a tail. Here we can see, again, the close-up stuff because we got on the surface right here it sort of before it bounced into a shady area. One of the things that's happening also is a comet tumbles. It doesn't just rotate, it sort of tumbles. So what part stays in sunlight is tricky to determine before you get on the surface along the way. What the tails leave behind just sort of linger there, and as our planet sweeps through it, we get meteor showers. In fact, we're going through one in August of uh, 2020, and we go through one every August, called the Perseids, and that is a leftover comet tail that we go through every year in the same location along the way. It always looks like the meteors are coming from the same spot, so the ones that we see in August look like they're all coming from the constellation Perseus, which is why we call it Perseid, but in fact it's not that way. What's happening is we have the Perseids here that are coming at us, but the Perseus constellation is way, 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 way back behind. So what we're seeing is sort of like something that's going in front of something that's far behind and we're calling it of the thing that's behind it. So when we look at the Leonids, they're coming from Leo. If we look at the Aquanids, they're coming from Aquarius, except they're not really coming from any of those areas. They're coming from that portion of the sky where Leo is, or that portion of the sky where Aquarius is. There are lots of meteor showers. The Perseid is one of the best because of two reasons. One, it can have as, as many as uh, 30 to 50, if you're really lucky, 100 particles per hour. So you go out and you watch and you watch and you watch and you'll see stuff, which is harder to do if there are only 10 per hour. So you've got to sort of watch every five to six minutes, you might see one. The other thing is, it occurs in July and August. Who wants to be lying out on the back deck in January looking up for these things? Yeah, so it, it's, it's, it's one of the better ones. When we look for comets, we look for their orbit so we can tell how far out they've come from. Uh, this is Comet Hale-Bopp, and it was before Neowise, the, the last one that we could really see with the naked eye. 
And that one, we could see two tails with the naked eye. We could see the dust tail and the plasma tail that, that, that were coming up. This was from the 1990s. There are two main areas where comets come from. One is called the Kuiper Belt, and it's just out beyond Neptune and Pluto. In fact, we often call Pluto and Sedna and Eris and Makimaki Maki and all those other dwarf planets KBOs, which stands for Kuiper Belt Object. So KBO, Kuiper Belt Object. They're all in the same plane. Remember, all of the planets go around in the same pancake-shaped area around our, our sun. They're all pretty much in the same area there, too. And they're all maybe within 100 AUs. Remember, one AU is the distance between the sun and the Earth. So they're about 100 times out at most. We'll probably have 100,000, maybe 200,000 comets that are pretty good size along the way. But then way, way, way out, 50,000, not a little hundred, but 50,000 AUs or so, there's this huge cloud called the Oort cloud. And instead of just being in that sort of plane of the planets, it's everywhere. It's up above and in front and behind. It's, it's a sphere. It's almost as if we're living inside a snow globe with all of these comets. And the reason why they're all hanging out there is the sun's energy pushed them away, but the sun's gravity is pulling them in. And that's the equilibrium point. And this goes out almost about a quarter of the way to the nearest star. So if another star gets too close to us, it can shake up that Oort cloud and throw extra comets in at us along the way. So we occasionally get extra comets. Kuiper Belt objects formed when the rest of the planets were forming. There's not a lot of energy out there, so they're all really slow moving. The further out you are, the slower it, uh, your, your orbit is around the sun. Uh, Oort cloud objects are just almost in suspended animation out there. Now, one of the reasons why Pluto gets qualified as a KBO, a Kuiper Belt object, is rather than a, a planet in its own right, is because it actually overlaps with Neptune. And one of the definitions now for planets, and it's still controversial, uh, but, but one of, one of the uh, definitions is a planet has to be sort of the king of its own domain. It has to be in charge of its orbit. And if Pluto and Neptune are in overlapping orbits, then Neptune clearly wins, because Neptune is 17 times the size of the Earth, and Pluto's maybe about the size of a quarter of the United States, maybe about half the size of the United States. Very, very, very small by comparison. Uh, Neptune's going to be, uh, I'm going to say, 300 to 400 times larger than Pluto. Uh, but also, here's the weird thing. As most of the planets are going around almost flat, just a little bit of variation here, Pluto actually goes at a 17 degree angle up and down. So it's not sort of all the way up and down 90 degrees, so it's not an Oort cloud kind of thing, but it's at an orbit that's inclined, and that makes it strange as well. Now we thought for a brief time when it was first discovered that it might have been an escaped moon of Neptune. And if you remember when we were talking about the moons of the planets, Neptune's moon Triton actually is a captured moon rather than an escaped moon. But the thing is, Pluto and Neptune are never in the same place at the same time, as you can sort of see from our, our grid here. When Neptune is at the crossing point, Pluto is not there. And by the time Neptune gets over here to the, this other crossing place, Pluto will be down here. So they're never in the same place at the same time if you rewind the tape. So they'd have to be in the same place at the same time if one was an escaping. Now, when we discovered Pluto in 1930, uh, we had trouble for a while figuring out how bright it was, how far away it was, how large it was, because we were expecting something much larger. Then around the 1970s, we discovered that, in fact, it was two different things that are going around each other. Now, Charon is small enough that we think about it in moon uh, moon uh, uh, terms, but in fact, Pluto and Charon are close enough in size together, there are some who want to describe it as a double object, where they're going around each other. And in fact, they both face each other. As Charon goes around Pluto, it keeps the same face to Pluto, 
So if you're on the far side of Charon, you would never see Pluto. But here's the thing, Pluto also keeps the same face towards Charon. So it's sort of like they don't trust each other. They're always facing each other as they're going around. Uh, and that's another reason why they can be described as a, a dual object, a double object system. Uh, Hydra and Nix, Styx and Kerberos both came along later. Uh, Hydra and Nix were discovered when the New Horizons probe was, was already going on its, its mission there. New Horizons, Nix, Hydra, NH, that's not a mistake. Styx and Kerberos were discovered even later as they were trying to map out how to get New Horizons through without hitting anything. And of course, all of these are underworld figures. Pluto is the god of the underworld for the Romans. Charon is the guy who rows you across the river Styx. So, so they kept a consistency there in terms of naming. It is much, much more like a comet than a planet. That's why it doesn't really fit either terrestrial planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, or Jovian planets. Certainly not Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Uh, so, so that's one of the reasons why it got demoted. But when we're talking about it, it is, in fact, very, very cold. It 40K, 40 Kelvin. Remember, Kelvin is the, the uh, temperature gauge that starts at absolute zero, which is about minus 273 and some change from uh, Celsius. So that's minus 233 degrees Celsius. So we're talking minus 400, 450 degrees in Fahrenheit terms, uh, maybe, yeah, maybe minus 400, we're going to say. Uh, that's really, really cold. Uh, that is really, really cold. In fact, it is so cold that when winter comes on Pluto, and I always think of Pluto as the Game of Thrones planet, when winter comes, and it's coming, the atmosphere is so frozen that it falls to the surface. And here's the thing. Winter is happening right now on Pluto. And winter happens for the whole planet at the same time because it goes far away from the sun. And winter lasts for 150 years. So if we were going to see this atmosphere at all, we had to get there by 2015 or 2016. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to see it again until the year 2170 or so. And that's a long, long wait. Now, they figured this out back in the 1980s. We planned the New Horizons probe starting in 1988, and it took until 2015, almost 30 years, to get there because you have to plan it, you have to fund it, you have to build it, you have to launch it, it has to get there. It takes a while to get to the outer planets. You had a discussion board topic talking about that. But when we got there, this is what we saw. Fabulous, fabulous stuff. We can see different colorations on the surface. We can see different types of terrain. We have uh, sort of mottled terrain here. We have smoother terrain here. Things freeze and melt and refreeze. Things flow on the surface. Here's an impact crater here. We see some impact craters as well. We have snow and ice. We have mountain ranges that are probably made pretty much from water ice. Imagine going out to the Rockies and seeing all of that just ice rather than the mountain, the rocks that they're made of. It, it's like frozen, you know, let it go, let it go. And here we have the atmosphere. Notice we have these streaks. They're like layers and layers and layers. But Pluto was already in the process of edging into winter. So the, the layers were beginning to condense further and further down towards the surface. Uh, but, but it was a remarkable thing. Then here's Charon, which is the moon, and we can see the sort of brown patch up here. Notice the brown on Pluto as well. Even though it is far, far, far away from the sun, it's 30 times further away from the sun than we are, which means it gets one nine hundredth of the sunlight, it still gets enough for it to interact with the sunlight. And that's what a lot of these colorations are, uh, interaction with the sun. We might even call them sunburns in a way. But we have smooth areas, we have pockmarks and craters out here, we have some lava flowing areas along the way. So, so we have lots of activity happening on Charon as well as on Pluto. So Pluto's size has gone sort of up and down as we've sort of estimated and, and re-estimated over time. 
Uh, we're, we're sort of still figuring out whether it's larger than Eris right now. The votes are that it is larger than Eris, but we haven't been as close to Eris as we have to Pluto. So if we ever make it close to them, and uh, uh, because Eris has a moon as well, so I'll say them, uh, we might then recalibrate yet again. But dwarf planets, unlike the big planets like Neptune and Uranus and Saturn and even the Earth and even Mercury have not cleared all the other objects out of their path. And that's one of the reasons why they're dwarf planets rather than actual planets. Now, as you've seen with asteroids, with comets, with Pluto, things get hit out there. We have cosmic collisions. One of the biggest ones was in 1994. SL9 stands for Shoemaker-Levy 9. Remember I told you the Shoemakers and David Levy discovered this. They discovered eight comets before. That's why we've got a nine there. Uh, if, I think they were up to 12 or 13 before they started naming them something else because people were like, well, this is getting hard. Uh, so, so if you discover a comet, you get to name it. But if you discover more than one now, they'll try to figure out a way of getting a different name so it doesn't get uh, uh, mixed up. But shoemaker Levy 9 we will not make any mistakes on because it's the one that crashed into Jupiter. As it was getting close to Jupiter, Jupiter's gravity tore it apart. Easy to do. It's a snowball. It's not going to stay together much. But as it was hitting the planet, notice these big impacts. This is an artist's conception. If you are standing on Io, remember Io is the moon with volcanoes, this is what you might see. Just hit, 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 hit. Each of these impact sites is larger than the Earth. And then when we look at it in infrared, and this isn't an artist recreation, this is an actual photo, look at this fireball. This fireball is five times the size of the Earth. If this comet had hit the Earth, we wouldn't have this class here going on today. We've had other things that have hit Jupiter. This one we didn't even see, which is a little bit scary because this crevice in the atmosphere, which cleared up within a couple of weeks because that's what clouds do, but this is also larger than the Earth. If this had been hit, or if the Earth had been hit by this object, and we don't even know what this object was, uh, it would have really, really done some damage. And that was in 2009. So there are lots of act active processes taking place out there. We have, of course, been hit. Impact hit in Mexico, in uh, what we would now consider sort of the Mayan region, the Yucatan region, 65 million years ago. It caused a mass extinction on the Earth. Part of our evidence for that is what's called the iridium layer. Do you have any iridium at home? I'll bet you do, because you have one of these. So do I. I have one of these. So if you, if you can't really see it all that well, it's a phone. Uh, so, so once upon a time, if you're as old as I am, you had to have this big, long antenna that would come out of your phone, and it still didn't function very well. Iridium gives it a higher sensitivity, so you don't need to have some antenna sticking out or doing anything like that. But iridium is pretty rare. What we have discovered is everywhere on Earth there's this fine powdering of iridium at a certain layer down. If you dig far enough down, pretty much everywhere on Earth, including Antarctica, including Australia, North and South America, Africa, Europe, Asia, all over the place. 65 million years, you sort of dig down far enough, dig down far enough, dig down far enough, dig down far enough. We find iridium. When we're looking for dinosaurs, let's say this is the iridium layer here. Dinosaurs are always found below that layer. They're never found above that layer, except for one type of dinosaur. We still got them today. They're called birds. But the, the regular kinds of dinosaurs that we think about, Jurassic Park kinds of dinosaurs, no, they're all down here below this. So we can put that together and say, well, whatever caused this worldwide extinction around this time may have also caused this worldwide iridium layer around this time. Hmm, what could have caused that? What could have made that happen? Well, if you've got something five, six miles across, that's 10 kilometers. If you've ever run a 10K race, you'll know how big that is. Boom kicks up stuff into the atmosphere that can last for years. If we have volcanoes today that will erupt 
and they will put dust and debris that will actually last in the atmosphere for several years. So if this lasted for years and years and began to block out some, if not most, of the sun, plants would stop to grow, temperatures would change, and it would cause a mass extinction. Remember what I said in an earlier lecture about climate change? This was the mother of all climate changes in the most recent past. Our climate has been changing a lot for a lot of reasons. This was one of the principal ones along the way. And you wouldn't even notice this impact site because it's right on the edge of the sea, the Gulf of Mexico. And this part in the Yucatan Peninsula is covered with jungle. This part, of course, is in the ocean. But when you look at it from up above with remote sensing satellite technology, you can begin to see this ring. There's a ring and a central peak that happened there. Things came in, hit, and splat kicked up the dust and debris, and it probably incinerated everything within 1,000 miles uh, for, for almost instantly. But it really changed the ecosystem of the planet for years, maybe decades to come, and it took a while for things to repopulate and reconstitute. Anything big that lived on plants, like dinosaurs, died out. Anything small, especially anything small that could regulate its own temperature, but since things got cold, uh, survived. Birds could regulate their own temperature inside. So could mammals. And that's why we had the rise of the mammals after that. We still get hit. We don't have major impacts so much anymore, although there may be one before too long. We never know. We are on the hunt for where asteroids and comets may impact us, but because asteroids and comets tumble rather than orbit, they can always go a little bit off and eventually hit us. We're not gonna be hit any time in the next year. We're not gonna be hit any time in the next five years. But beyond that, the chances go up and up and up because we do get hit. And the last major hit, was something that was maybe about half the size of a football field, and it hit in Tunguska, Siberia in 1908. Now, this was a hard enough impact that earthquake measurement devices, sort of Richter scale devices, halfway around the world in England and halfway around the world in the other direction in San Francisco, were actually registering something hit the planet. Something actually caused shockwaves to go through the planet. And it took about 20 years for them to come up, and they found trees flattened for hundreds of miles in every direction. Now, chances are there were some people who were killed by this. I'd said earlier that there were no verified deaths from anyone being hit by a meteorite. This is probably the big exception, except, again, nobody, nobody knew if anyone did die from this. We, we, we have no way of knowing uh, what happened. Now, Russia gets hit quite a bit. Russia is a big country nearer the North Pole, and if you're nearer the poles, you're more likely to get hit because of the way dynamics uh, operate there. But, but it gets hit on a regular basis by things, and this is one that was 20 meters, so about half the size of the Tunguska things over Chilabinks in 2013. This one did some damage. This one sort of like shattered all the windows in high-rise buildings and, and created sonic booms and other kinds of things along the way. So small impacts happen every day. Larger impacts happen less and less frequently, which is good for us. So if we have something that's coming after us, we don't know about it yet. If it is an asteroid, we're probably going to figure it out long before it would ever hit us. If it's a comet, we're not always as attuned to that because, again, those come without warning. But we are looking into it. You can actually join this website here, impactarcnasa.gov, and perhaps do some of the activities that they have to help figure that out. Now, because we have big planets out there, especially guarding us from the comets, we are less likely to be hit because comets coming in like Shoemaker-Levy 9 or like whatever that object was in 2009, are more likely to hit Jupiter or these other planets before they make it into the inner solar system. 
So they've got to get past our guards out here before they get to us. That makes a big difference along the way. So our water may be in part due to early comet impacts or early asteroid impacts. Uh, some asteroids have H2O ice on, on them as well. Uh, so it may be that it's sort of a love-hate relationship. We don't want to have them hit us, but we're glad in some ways that they did at some point. So one of the things astrobiologists ask is not just how does life form and do we have carbon and water, but are the conditions right for life? And one of the conditions for life may be having big planets like Jupiter standing guard over the smaller planets along the way. So that is it for that chapter. And I will see you again for chapter 13, Lucky 13.